Welcome, everyone. My name is Karen Brodsky, and I am the director of the Arts and Lectures Program here in the library. Um, we're so glad to see you all here for our immigration, our second in, um, session in our immigration series. And um, today I have the honor of introducing these fine folks to y'all. And I just want to let you know that there um, are cards in the back and also um, eight and a half by 11 sheets that you can take, you know, as many as you want, give them out to your friends, and it gives a list of the rest of the series. Um, and I also just want to take a quick second to thank everyone who's helped put this series together. There was a partnership between the library, the Department of Chicana and Latino Studies, Associated Student Productions, um, the Department of Theater Arts, the Department of Modern Language and Languages and Literature, and also Res Life. So, and the Multicultural Center. So, all those different people work together to pull this um, this off, at Campbell and the Library. Okay, so for today, we're doing Immigration 101, the second in our series, and to um, my far right is, your left, is Daniel Malpica, who is um, an assistant professor in the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies, um, as well as a Teacher of the Year this last year, right? So he's very fabulous. Sitting next to him is um, Patricia Kimmer Hall, who is also in the Department of Chicano and Latino Studies, and um, also a past recipient of Teacher of the Year Award. So let's go count that. Yes, go count. And um, Daniel, Patricia, Paula Hammett, who's in the back, and myself, um, a few years ago started really thinking about, well, let's put together something on immigration, and one of the first things that popped up when we were thinking about who to bring, who could help us understand some of the issues, was Marie McSorley, who is an immigration attorney here in the county. She also works on adoption um, cases, I guess is the way to say that. She, um, has a wealth of knowledge that she's going to share with us today, and is kind of going old school with the whiteboard, so that's really fun. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to these three people and um, let them, you know, take up most of the hour. Thank you. Woo. So good afternoon to all of you. I'm the first person that's going to be talking about and. The basic way of actually looking at our presentation, the way I sort of envision it, it is sort of like a crash course on immigration, and at the same time sort of providing you all with uh, setting the tone for the next couple of sessions that we're actually going to be having in our guest lecture series. So what I want to do today, and the rest of the panelists, is just to provide you a general overview of immigration, and at the same time, why is it that we should be concerned and interested? And also, why is it that we should make this um, something very, very pertinent in terms of our lives? So let me first start out by mentioning the following. That the movement of people across national borders represents one of the most vivid dramas of social reality in contemporary world. If immigrants are the central characters of this drama, there are numerous other dramatic personas whose supporting roles are crucial to determining the ultimate course of events. And these include the family and friends left behind in the homeland, the government officials and employers in both sending and receiving countries, other immigrants from the homeland who have become part of the ethnic community, sympathetic members of religious and other institutions concerned with assisting newcomers, and people who through either organized or spontaneous means express their hostility towards immigrants. And as this guest lecture series seeks to illustrate, the drama also involves social scientists involved in the study of migrants. And lawyers, health providers, community activists, nonprofit organizations, artists, all working and also serving the migrant population. 
So why is it that immigration issues should be important to all of us? I want to mention sort of three main points. The first point is this. Immigration is increasingly significant because of economic globalization. Globalization has accelerated communication, capital flows, tourism, and trade among countries in many parts of the world, as well as people. The second point that's important, and this is pertaining to the United States, is this. That immigration is significant because it has made this nation into a diverse society. So today, the United States has become a multiracial society. Most migrants that come to the United States are in fact non-white. So when we have this discussion of immigration to the United States, we have to sort of forget this old binary that we understood in terms of issues dealing with race. We have to go beyond the white-black dichotomy. And we really have to incorporate these new migrants, these new individuals who are actually living in the United States, as these and also Asians living among us in the United States. The third very important point is that immigration has now become a global phenomenon. And it, not only is the United States being transformed by immigration, but all other countries, other countries are also being transformed. So for example, the United States is being impacted by Asians and Latinos, and particularly Mexicans. And what's really, really interesting in terms of the Mexican case is that Mexicans today are not only going to the Southwest, but are also going to the South and also going to the Midwest. So there's this sort of Mexicanization of the United States, or as some scholars refer to it, as the browning of the United States. But it's not only the United States being impacted by migration. There's also other countries that are being impacted. For example, the case of Italy and Spain in Europe is a case in point. Traditionally, these two countries sent people abroad. So, for example, in the case of Italians, they went literally to all parts of the world. They went to the United States, to different parts of South America. But now, many individuals are in fact going into Europe, and particularly countries like Italy and also in Spain. Asian countries are also being impacted. A case in point is the case of Japan. So let's talk a little bit about numbers. In terms of the estimate number of people living outside of their country of birth, you can see them here in this notation. In 1970, we were basically talking about around roughly 82 million individuals that were basically living not in the place of their birth, that were basically migrants. Notice that by 2005, we had people that were in fact migrating 191 million individuals. That's quite significant. And if you take into consideration from 1990 all the way to 2005, we have a very important 59% increment. So you might ask yourself, what does this 191 million in fact mean? So I thought of doing it in this way so people would get a better perspective of what that actual number means. So we're basically talking about that one out of every 35 people in the world is in fact a migrant. This is around 3% of the world's population. And you might think, well, this is not very significant. But if you put it in terms of the population of a specific country, this is equivalent to the population of Brazil. And if you know a little bit about Brazil, this is the fifth largest country in the planet. So there, it becomes extremely significant. In terms of proportion of migrants living in Europe, we're talking more or less around 7.7% of Europeans' population. And in the case of the United States, we're talking about 13%. Notice that these are numbers in 2005. In terms of the United States, the latest numbers that I've seen, 2009, 2010, Basically, demographers are telling us that we actually have reached the 15% criteria, one five of migrants living in the United States. All right, this last, next slide speaks to this issue of who are the migrants here in the United States. And this is a very, very important point because we have this sort of stereotype that for the most part, most migrants are labor migrants. 
what does this exactly mean? These are individuals who work as menial workers, that work in manufacturing work, work in the service industry, and work in low-skill type of employment. Yes, many of the migrants, in fact, work in this area, but we have other types of migrants, and this is very, very important to understanding migrants coming to the United States. We also have, for example, professional migrants. These are individuals that are actually allocated special visas. They're called H-1B visas. And the United States allocates these visas to these individuals so they can actually come as professionals. These individuals have master's degrees, PhDs, and they actually come to the United States and work as professionals. But there's other categories that play also. So for example, we have entrepreneurs. These are individuals that back home, for the most part, were professionals, and for whatever reason, could not actually work as professionals here. And they actually move into small entrepreneurship, small business owners. And this group also becomes very, very significant. They create many jobs, they create many services, and they also cater to many different individuals. So this group also becomes very significant. We also have refugees. So these are individuals that are basically fleeing for political purposes, and they're afraid for their lives. And the United States and many countries throughout the world actually grant refugee status to these individuals. All right. This chart I think is quite significant because it gives you a sense of how many people were actually asked immigrants in the United States. So bear in mind we're talking 2005, we're talking around more or less 37 million individuals. But notice that all the immigrants are not only undocumented migrants. Notice here on the red, there's many migrants that are also in the United States are in fact here legally. And I think this discussion is very, very important. Notice unauthorized or in the sort of common parlance is this idea of illegal immigrants. They occupy around 30% of the population. But there's other categories. Legal permanent residents, they occupy around 28% of the population. Naturalized citizens, they occupy around 32% of the population. And then we also have temporary legal residents and also refugees. So this notion that we have that all immigrants are undocumented, it really is false. Again, they occupy roughly around 30% of the population. All right, so I thought that it would make a lot of sense to provide all of you with a definition, terms to refer to the undocumented population, and also just provide all of you with sort of estimates of how big this population is within the United States. So here you have um, an actual definition. So somebody who is undocumented is a person who resides in the United States, but who is not a U.S. citizen, has not been admitted for permanent residence, and is not in a set of specific authorized temporary status, permitting long-term residency and also work. In terms of numbers, again, remember we're talking about 2005, they occupy roughly around 11.1 million individuals. So we're talking about 30% of the total foreign born. The next figure that you see below is really, really interesting because it basically captures how is it that these individuals came inside the United States. Notice that 55% were basically undocumented entrants. What that means is that these individuals were smuggled in one way or another to the United States. And that's 55% of the, the general population. But notice that we also have visa overstayers. And that's very, very significant because the United States does not concentrate on this group. We have the sort of preoccupation of building these big walls, fences, etc., and we always are trying to pay attention to how to solve this issue of undocumented immigration by building these huge walls along the border, and we're never talking about these visa overseers. So this is also key and very, very important. Here, this pie graph is also, I think, quite interesting because it really provides all of us with the sense that, first, not all undocumented individuals are, in fact, Mexican. <laughs> no? So notice that there are 50%, yes, significant, but what's the other 50% that nobody talks about? 
I always tell my students, for example, I know many individuals who are undocumented, who are from China, India, Canada, Europe, and we never talk about those individuals. And I think discussing and having a dialogue of why is it that these individuals also migrate as undocumented individuals becomes very significant. Notice Asia, 13%. Very, very significant. And also Europe, and also Africa. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about this issue of explaining the demand for immigrant labor. And what this means is this, that when we're talking about immigration, it is extremely important that we think about the pool factors, the demand side of immigration. Why is it that these people come? Well, they come because there's jobs for them. And this is extremely important to understanding migration. Part of the reason why there's this big demand is there's a number of reasons, and I have them actually here listed. One of them is the demand for low-wage workers. I've had the opportunity to interview many, many employers in manufacturing, service, hospital industry, restaurant industry, and all of these managers, all these personal managers or owners of these firms, they always tell you, we need these workers because they're pivotal to our franchise. If we did not have these workers, our business would not be able to actually subsist. So that becomes extremely <coughs> important. There's also very important technological innovation. Many of our workplaces have been changed dramatically because of technological innovations. At one point, these jobs were quite skilled, and now they have actually been de-skilled, and because of that, many immigrants are actually able to actually fill these specific positions. There's also been, during the last 30 years or so, a shift in attitudes of native-born born workers in terms of certain types of jobs. So, For example, many of these employers that I have, have had the opportunity to interview tell me, you know, basically native-born workers do not want these jobs. They don't want the jobs in the fast food industry. They don't want the jobs in our, um, you know, these restaurants, for example, working in the back of the house. They don't want these jobs working at hotels, being <laughs> after us when we go to these very fancy hotels. These individuals basically shun these types of jobs, and that's when many immigrants, in fact, come in and become substitutes. Another very important point is this. Why is it that there's so little regulation in terms of the labor market, particularly among undocumented migrants? So my students very astutely always tell me, why is it that ICE or INS does not go to these day labor sites? Why is it that ICE does not go to the garment industry on a regular basis to rate these sites? Well, that becomes very significant as it pertains to this issue. Basically, the United States has not wanted to tackle the issue of undocumented migration in the United States, but really has focused on the actual war. And then the other issue, and this is something that Maureen McSorley will actually discuss, is this lack of available visas for migrants throughout the world to come to the United States. This is extremely important. Very difficult to get a working visa, and in part, this explains quite a bit of why is it that many migrants come as undocumented migrants. So let me pass it to Murray. Okay. Okay.
I guess we should start with, there are two types of visas. Um, there's a non-immigrant visa, and that is called an NIV, a non-immigrant visa, okay? And then there's the immigrant visa, which is your green card, your legal permanent resident card. Immigrant visa, okay. So, in order to get a non-immigrant visa, you, um, you can apply from abroad. So you can apply from whatever country you're from. There's an American consulate there, and you would, you would go in and you would apply for a non-immigrant visa. Now, a non-immigrant visa, for example, you could get a B-2. That would be a tourist visa. Um, you could get a B-1, which is a business visa, but you're not allowed to work while you're here on either a B-2 or a B-1 visa. It's just a tourist visa. Or you could come in to, um, to perhaps negotiate a contract or perhaps um, feel out certain job opportunities if you wanted to potentially open a business here or something. But you cannot work and you cannot gain any income from a source in the United States. That issue, this visa is issued for six months, generally. You can also extend that visa sometimes for up to 18 months. Generally, immigration doesn't want to give it to you for 18 months, then they'll give it to you potentially for 12 months. Um, before even that, there's a visa waiver program. And that is a program that a lot of European countries and certain countries who are considered our allies, they allow certain people to come into the United States without a visa. So that's an easy thing to do. You just come in on, and they give you a little card. It's the visa waiver and they allow you to stay here for 90 days on that visa. But with this, um, the great thing about the non-immigrant visa is that if you get here on one, then you can change it to a different kind as long as you remain in status. The key is remaining in status. If they give you a visa, then you must maintain, in stat maintain your status. If you're one day out of status, they will not let you switch to another type of a visa, okay? So, um, so here are some of the non-immigrant visas. A B2, there are employment type non-immigrant visas. So as the, Mr. Malpica mentioned, there is an H-1B visa, for example. An H-1B visa is for professionals, someone who has a bachelor's degree. Um, for, it can be from anywhere in the world. If they would like to come here and they have a bachelor's degree, they may qualify for this visa. For this type of visa, you need an employer. So you need, an, you need a job. You need someone to um, offer you a job. Um, and you, the person needs to have a bachelor's degree at least and you need to prove that the job requires a bachelor's degree in order to be able to do it. So there are certain core jobs that they have historically uh, approved in H-1B status, such as a teacher, um, an accountant, you know, that normally require a bachelor's degree in order to be able to do it. Um, there are other jobs that are a little bit a little bit out of the norm, and for those you have to argue hard, harder as to you know, that that job does indeed require a bachelor's degree in order to be able to do it. An H-1B is a great visa, it's for three years, <coughs> and then you could extend it another three years, and so you could get a total of six years. If in that time period your employer files for your green card, your legal permanent resident card, you can get another extension annually, so you could go, you know, to seven, eight, nine years, up until the time when you're waiting for your residency. Okay, you must maintain your employment with that employer. Okay, you can switch to another employer, but you have to switch your H-1B. Um, so there are a lot of regulations regarding the H-1B and all employment-based visas because there has been a lot of fraud in the past, according to immigration, uh, in, in applying for and, and maintaining these visas. So there are a lot of things, when, when you work um, with this type of a visa, you also must initially go through the Department of Labor, okay? Now the Department of Labor, they're the ones, they will say um, what the prevailing wage is for this job. And the employer must agree to pay the prevailing wage as well as comply with a couple of other um, uh, things that the immigration sets forth as uh, requirements for this visa. But they have to agree to pay the prevailing wage. So again, this was set up by our government in order to protect our labor market, allegedly. 
So what it does is it says, well, we'll allow foreigners in to do this job, but you must treat them in all respects like U.S. workers, and you must pay them what you would pay a U.S. worker. And that is, to your point, to prevent allowing foreign people in and paying them a low wage or treating them in a poor fashion. Okay? Um, another great visa is an L1 visa. That is for intra-company transferees. So if you had a company in another country and you had a company here and you wanted to transfer your employees in and out, you could potentially get an L1 visa. And again, that would be um, for up to five years. Um, and from all of these, ideally, your ideal immigrant would come in nicely with a non-immigrant visa, maintain their status the entire time, and then they could file and get their residence, their legal permanent residency. Now, the investor visa that we were discussing is an E-2. An E-2 is if someone has <coughs> money. You know, let's say they don't have a bachelor's degree, so we cannot get them an H-1B, but they have some money. Um, to invest in a, a business here. It can be any type of business. It doesn't matter what type. And the amount they need to um, invest in this business is, there is no fixed amount. But approximately, you know, a minimum of sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars 80000 minimum. And um, in, with this visa, um, there is no requirement that you hire a certain number of of U.S. workers or anything like that. You basically just need to invest in the business and come to the United States to direct and control that company. Okay, so, and then they will give you that visa initially, generally for two years. And after the two years, they want to see how your business is doing. They want to see your tax return. They want to see that you're making, you don't have to make a great profit for the first five years. But after five years, they would like to see a substantial profit. They would also like to see that you are hiring U.S. workers in your business. So again, this piece is wonderful because it's indefinite. So once you get it, you can get it the rest of your life. You'll never have legal permanent residence, but you can you can have it the rest of your life. So And eventually, they'll give you five years. And you can come in and out. You can travel in and out. We have a lot of uh, international um, businessmen that come and do this. They have businesses everywhere, and they're traveling. Um, Let's see. So that, um, now I've done these for, you know, restaurants, uh, different, you know, Thai restaurants and different different types of restaurants. I've done them for um, a winery owner. I've done them for, it, it just doesn't matter. I mean, they, they really, we had someone who had a carpet cleaning business that did an EG visa. So the sky's sort of the limit. Um, Okay, so there's some of your main types of visas. Um, and as I said, and then there's, then you have the option of an employer filing for someone's immigrant visa, so for their legal permanent residence. Now, generally speaking, this requires a labor certification. Again, this was set up by the Department of Labor and in coordination with immigration to protect the U.S. workers. For the labor certification, you have to test your market. So you have to recruit for the job. So um, what that requires is there's a difference in recruitment between professional jobs and unprofessional jobs. Um, for a professional job, you would need to recruit two Sundays in a local newspaper, 30 days on the EDD Cal jobs, and then uh, three other sources. You should use three other sources. If you do that and you receive no qualified U.S. workers, now, you cannot tailor the job specifically so that the foreign worker will qualify for that job. So let's say, you know, you want to bring someone here from Russia. You can't say, I, I need someone who speaks Russian and, and English and uh, can translate, uh, you know, at, you know, from this language into another, um, unless it is a crucial part of the job. You can't do that, for example, for someone to work you know, in a dry cleaning company or something. I mean, it would have to be, the, the requirements must have to do with the job, okay? Um, and the Department of Labor has very rigid guidelines about, about what 
what you need to do every single job, you know? So they set forth um, what would be a restrictive requirement for a job. So that's where our lawyer comes in because it just takes a lot of work to figure that out and review all of the Department of Labor regulations and figure out what would be deemed restrictive, what would not. Um, so let's just say you can get through that entire process, which is quite burdensome. Um, so you recruit and you find no, S no U.S. workers qualified to do the job. Then you can submit the labor certification with the Department of Labor. And they, you know, they'll take their time to adjudicate that. That would be, you know, now they're taking about a year probably to get through that. Uh, the Department of Labor also has the right to audit the company who does the labor certification. So um, if, you know, if they see any type of issue um, for them, then they can ask the employer for all of their records. They want to see all the records of the recruitment. They want to see how you interviewed the person. And you need to make, they want to make sure that you're not, they're not tailoring that job for the foreign worker. So um, they can ask for all your records. So it's quite burdensome for an employer to go out and do this. It's, it's pretty much opening yourself up to the government and saying, come on in and look at everything I have. Um, so if you were able to do that, though, let's just say you could get through that process. Um, then number two is you would file an immigrant visa petition with immigration. Now, immigration now is the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, USCIS. And what they do is they adjudicate affirmative applications for an immigration benefit. So that means if you want to go forward and apply for some kind of a benefit, this is the agency that you will be dealing with. If you're dealing with a case defensively, meaning that uh, the, the person has already been arrested or is in custody, then you're dealing with ICE, which is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So they, they divided that. In a way, it's good because when you go affirmatively to apply for a benefit, let's say in San Francisco, you know that ICE is not right there waiting for you if anything were to mess up or something, where they used to be that, they used to be like that. You know, but now um, ICE, is, ICE is apart from them. So we'll, we'll discuss them in a minute. But anyway, with the I-140, you show that the, um, you show that the foreign worker is qualified to do the job, and you show that the employer has the ability to pay the prevailing wage again. Now, again, they want to see all of the employer's tax returns. And let's say that, let's say that the, uh, the wage is $50,000 a year for, the, for this job. Well, they want to see a profit of $50,000 sitting there with which you can pay this employee. Um, so unless you have that, now some people will get through the whole labor certification process and some often, I don't know what, what goes wrong, but they're not told that you know, the employer must show the ability to pay that wage, and when the employer can't show that, even though they have this nice and approved, the hard part, they can't get through this. So um, that's very heart-wrenching. Um, okay, now the third part then, if you get past that, is, um, it's called, well, there are two different ways to do this, but this is where the um, farm worker that applies for the residency. So you have either the I-45 or consular processing. Okay, so with this, um, this is, everything changes then. No longer about the employer. At the end, it's only about the, the uh, foreign worker that's trying to immigrate here. It's about whether they are eligible to enter the United States. At this stage, immigration considers whether someone is admissible to the United States or not. Uh, they have a long list of reasons that someone would be deemed inadmissible. For example, um, you know, certain criminal grounds will make someone inadmissible to the United States. Uh, not all criminal grounds. Uh, <coughs> not a driving um, under the influence would not uh, would not make you inadmissible to the United States. However. Um, there are a variety of grounds for which someone could be deemed inadmissible. Misrepresentation, if you came into the United States and you presented a fake uh, residency card, uh, you could be deemed inadmissible. If you, um, if 
you came into the United States and presented a fake uh, a fake birth certificate of a U.S. citizen or a passport of a U.S. citizen, then that is a permanent bar. That is a false claim to U.S. citizenship, and that is a permanent bar after 97. Before 97, it was at least waivable, and we'll go through that in a bit. But um, that, that would be one of your permanent bars. Again, another issue, a big issue, um, is people who come into the United States and leave and come back in. So immigration has tried to cut down on recidiv recidivism. I can't say that word. Recidivism. Um, so basically, if you come in once, you know, you, you may be able to still uh, get your residency. But if you come in more than once, they are really, um, they really want to penalize you. Um, so let's just go over some of these real quick. Um, so if you, this is, a, this is an issue that affects most undocumented people here in the United States at current, because they didn't know this law, okay? So even, you know, in horrible situations where uh, someone is here undocumented, I, I see this all of the time, and they have, and they have an, a very sick parent in the home country, and they're dying, and they have to decide whether to see their parent one more time or other family member mm -hmm. yeah. for, for which they know they would have a bar when they ultimately try to immigrate, perhaps a permanent bar, or do they stay here and try to maintain their status? Um, it, it's a heart-wrenching decision, and it just happens all of the time. The, ways the, law, the way the law is set up now encourages undocumented people to stay here. It didn't used to be that way. But now everyone is becoming more and more aware of these bars and they know that if they leave, they're not going to ever be able to immigrate to the United States. And that's how serious it is. So the main bar that we're talking about, and this is whether you're getting your green card through an employer or through a family member, it doesn't matter, okay? So we have the three and 10 year bars. Okay, now the three-year three bar is if you've lived in the United States without authorization for more than six months, and then you leave the United States, you have a three-year bar. If you've lived in the United States more than one year, and you leave the United States, you have a 10-year bar. Now we have people who've been here undocumented for 10, 15, 20 years, but they've never left the United States, so they are not subject to these bars. But if they leave for whatever reason, then they have them. Now, the hard part is this, the permanent bar. So if someone goes out for whatever reason, even if it's for a day or half of a day, and they come back in a second time, so they've been here more than one year illegally, and then they go out and they come back into the United States illegally. <coughs> okay, so we have one year <coughs> in the U.S. illegally. So then when they leave the U.S., 10-year bar. But when they re-enter <coughs> re the U.S. a second time without authorization, they have a permanent bar. Oh, wait, we're almost done. Okay. So anyway, <clears throat> these are some of the things that most affect um, people when they're trying to immigrate to the United States. Um, yes? So what happens um, for somebody that is, you know, getting their papers done, and then they're asked to go out of the country for uh, some kind of, um, you know. Yeah, the 10-year bar? Yeah, no, like they're, they're doing their paperwork and say, well, you have to go to Mexico to do a, a uh, an interview for your paper. So they leave yeah. and they don't have any kind of documentation. Well, then they have a 10-year bar. And with a 10-year bar, there's a waiver, okay? Now, with the waiver, and a great deal of my practice right now is doing these waivers. The waiver, you have to show that the petitioner, the U.S. citizen or resident petitioner, now we're switching over to family-based petitions, but I, I hope I'm not confusing you. 
So family-based petition is if you have a, a family member filing for someone's a spouse's residency card um, or a family member. But um, often there's no way for them to get their legal permanent residency here in the United States, so they must return to Mexico in a process called consular processing to get their residency card. Well, when they leave, they have this 10-year bar, and they must submit a waiver. And with the waiver, you must show that the the petitioning spouse or petitioning family member would suffer extreme hardship if, uh, if the applicant were not admitted to the United States. And they analyze that in two ways. Number one, how would the, um, how would the petitioning spouse suffer if they stayed in the United States for the next 10 years without their family members? Or alternatively, how would they suffer if they had to go move to Mexico generally, in my cases, uh, the foreign country for the next 10 years. So they analyze both of those situations. They generally consider uh, 14 factors in those, uh, such as how would the uh, US citizen spouse, for example, be affected uh, financially? How would they be affected emotionally? How long have they lived in the United States? Uh, do, you know, um, do they have children here? Now, the weird, the horrible thing about this waiver is you must show hardship to a spouse or a parent that is a U.S. citizen or a resident. They do not consider children. So I have applicants with five U.S. citizen children, and they will not consider how the children would suffer without that parent. So it is. this is extremely difficult. This is, as I said, a majority of my practice right now. So it's family members of U.S. citizens. You know, they do not have to wait for a visa to a quota system. Let's say they're husbands and wives of U.S. citizens. And the families are just being separated. It is absolutely horrible. I have people in my office all the time crying, you know, before they leave. To make the decision to try this process is heart wrenching. And then they decide, what are they going to do? Will the kids go with the person to Mexico or will they stay here? with the U.S. citizen petitioner. Well, all, usually the U.S. citizen petitioner is staying here because they have to work, because they're the only one that can support the family, so they can't take care of the kids. They're working full time. So usually, generally speaking, this is just general, you know, we have a U.S. citizen husband here in the U.S. staying here to work, the wife, and she takes the kids with her. They're missing school. A lot of them, are, those kids are getting left back because they, by the time we get through this, it's taking, you know, several months. Um, and um, and the fathers here, you know, just you know, I just see it. They just deteriorate emotionally. I mean, they're waiting and waiting, and they're away from their family, and they call on the phone, and they don't, you know, it's 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 horrible. They they don't know if it's best to talk to them on the phone or not because everyone's crying when they're on the phone, and and it makes everyone feel worse to speak on the phone. Yet it's their only contact, and and their lives are literally torn apart. So. Um, just real quick, so the waiver, three things could happen. They could approve that waiver right away, not right away, four weeks, let's say. They could say, we need more evidence. I mean, and that happens arbitrarily often, where we have given a great deal of evidence of the hardship, and they need more, arbitrarily. There's nothing you can do. So then they're there for 12 months, basically. So you go from a month to 12 months overnight, arbitrarily. So that's 12 months. If they want more evidence, and it takes they take their good old time to look at the look at the application. If that's denied, if the waiver's denied, the person is stuck there for 10 years. These are the decisions that these people are making for their families. You know, it's just extremely risky. Generally speaking, 50% are approved here. 50% are approved quickly. Um, that's a clean case, no, no criminal record, nothing. You know, someone who's lived here for 15 years, they don't have anything on their record. Nice, clean case. Again, you might have someone in a bad mood, though, that just might put them here for no reason at all. Um, here, we have another, I, they're saying 30%. I, I think it's closer to 40% here. So overall, your success rate is 80 to 90%. You only have a few that are actually denied, per se. But it's still a risk. It's still, you never know when they could do that. And these are, again, these are family members of U.S. citizens. Um, so there's so much more I could talk about, but I think we're out of time. Well, I don't actually, know if you have a question. You know, um, 
I was going to give you an overview of the lecture series, but there's some lovely literature at the back where you can read that because um, I think, you know, what uh, uh, Dr. Malpica and, and, and Ms. McCormick have shown is that, uh, Ms. Malpica, yeah, okay. uh, have shown is that, you know, uh, there's a paradox about uh, immigration that it's driven by these macroeconomic global forces where basically globalization has created a global labor market. But because, at least for the United States, because of the way that um, the laws around immigration are managed, they they have these you know gut wrenching emotional consequences for people, and that's something we're going we're trying to explore in the lecture series. So some of our panels will will deal more with macroeconomic global issues around immigration. So next uh, our next panel will be David Bacon, who's going to talk about changes to the global economy and how that helps to criminalize immigrants. Um, right. In, in many ways. Um, and then we also have a panel on human trafficking. And then at the local level, right, because immigration might be driven by global forces, but you don't see global forces. You don't go to school with global forces. You know, you don't watch global forces be forcibly separated from their children. Uh, global forces are not your students. So it's felt at the local level. So we're going to have panels that address the local impact of immigration. Uh, the first panel, the resources panel, will talk about um, the experiences and the, the difficulties and issues that affect immigrant communities in our area. And then the second panel will talk about the economic impact of immigrants on everybody's wages, which is one of the one of the arguments that's often heard around immigration is that immigrants will lower wages for everyone. And so we're going to have um, experts to speak to that. But for right now, I think we have just questions. Um, I imagine Maureen's going to get to <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That that's the typo. That that would be me. It's April. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Good question. Good point. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. All right. It it's correct in the flyer. Ignore the slide. Does anyone else have any questions? I just want to understand what you were talking about. Back to their home country 
at which time they will have this ten, this ten year bar. So, um, uh, as I said, people have been here twenty years illegally. They don't have the bar. You only get the bar if you go back to your home country to go to the interview. So it's a catch twenty two, and it, it's the so a lot. This is the decision people are facing. Well, should I just stay here undocumented? You know, at least I'm with my family. At least we're safe. I mean, we've had over 34,000 deaths in Mexico in the past four years. 34,000. And they're bringing these little, you know, they're, they're going there with children, U.S. citizen children. They're placed in these awful situations. Uh, there's a lot of extortion going on. A lot of my clients are getting phone calls. If they know they have family members in the United States, they're getting phone calls saying, okay, well, you know, we have your, we know where you live, we know your family members, you know, give us this much money. And there's just, that's just one of the crimes going on. You know, I, I'm just waiting for the day, you know, I, I, I pray that this never happens, but the, the American consulate is in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. It's one of the most dangerous cities in the entire world. My clients are going there, all of them, and they have to go, they try to go, we have a couple of hotels that are safe, they never leave the hotel, they get a van to the consulate, but they first have to go to the medical exam, so they get a van there, and then they get a van to uh, the American consulate and go back, and they never leave. I've had clients see shootings across the street, I mean, this is where everyone's going, so it's just you mentioned that the visas were given out like on a lottery basis and very difficult to get. What is the, like how many are given out or is? Okay, well, um, there's a quota system in the United States which sets forth how many immigrants they'll allow in each year. If you are the family member of a legal permanent resident, you have to get on that list. If you're the family member of a U.S. citizen, there is a visa available for you immediately. So you don't have to be on the list. Uh, but if you're the family member of a resident, you're on the list. Now, yes, and, and it comes out every single month. It's called the Visa Bulletin, and the government produces that, showing how long you would have to wait. For example, and the categories are extremely slow in Mexico. Uh, there are four different categories. Uh, one is uh, single children over 21 of a U.S. citizen. One is married children uh, of a U.S. citizen. One is uh, the 2 a is um, spouses and children under 21 of legal permanent residents, and then 2B is um, children over 21 single of residents. Now, though, so I don't, that's a lot of information, but um, the waiting times are, and then there's, uh, there's siblings of U.S. citizens also. Siblings of U.S. citizens is about a 14 year wait. Uh, the other categories, all but 2A, are about 10. 16-year-old. Uh, for what reason may someone uh, lose their residency or citizenship once they're naturalized or permanent resident? Okay, once they're a permanent resident, it's not really permanent. They can take it away from you. The only thing they cannot take away from you is your U.S. citizenship, unless they were to prove that you had some kind of fraud when you got your U.S. citizenship. Now, for the residency, they could take it away. If you leave the United States for more than six months at a time, there is a presumption that you have abandoned your residence. That is a rebuttable presumption, so you could fight against that and say, no, I didn't. But if you, if you leave for more than one year at a time, there is a presumption that you have abandoned your residence. And they will, when you come back in, they will uh, put you in deportation proceedings. And one other thing also, whenever you apply affirmatively for an immigration benefit, if it is denied, you will be placed nowadays right into removal proceedings. And historically, it was not that. That only started about four years ago. So if you apply for a benefit and something went wrong and it weren't approved, a lot of people apply without a lawyer or you know get wrong advice and they erroneously apply. But they would deny the application, but they would allow the person to stay. But right now, if you're denied, you're right in removal proceedings. Uh, you do get a second shot at that point in front of a judge. Um, but, but you can be there. I thought that it's that when you have citizen Mary, the spouse automatically became a citizen. That's wrong. That's wrong. They have to go through that whole process. <laughs> 
Hi, um, I have a question. If someone comes in and they came in originally as a, on a tourist visa and they attend classes, and, and I know some of this happened to they re-entered and uh, the, the inspectors, border inspectors, saw that she had a, uh, a student ID card. And so she was sent right away to, is that, is there, what's the situation there? You're not supposed to study on a tourist visa. No. And, you know, it's funny because, again, it used to be different. So they've changed that. You're not supposed to study. And I had someone come in, and they were uh, in high school. So they went to Windsor High School, and they said, no, we're, we won't let you in on a tourist visa. But Healdsburg let them in, and schools in Santa Rosa let them. So uh, people don't understand the laws, and some, some schools let them study. But you're not supposed to study. You know, you're just supposed to be a tourist touring around visiting friends, family, things like that. Um, just one more thing. The other way you can lose your legal permanent residency is through criminal convictions. If you get certain criminal convictions or a crime of moral turpitude within the first five years, you, you will be placed in the local jail. You know, a lot of the people in the local jails have are legal permanent residents, but they, they can take that. Now, you have a chance to fight it, but um, if, for example, you have an aggravated felony, or not even an aggravated one, but just like a misdemeanor or a crime of moral turpitude, you can be placed in proceedings. So that's why it really is in everyone's interest to uh, file for U.S. citizenship as soon as possible. Oh, I, sorry. Just, oh, were you? Okay. You know what? I came at the end of this scene. They've already addressed it. And one of my daughter's best friend's parents brought her over illegally when she was four or five. And now she's you know, 10 years old, and she's, she's been here. Her father just went back to Mexico to visit a family member, or he can't come back now. Can this, is, and, they, and they're probably going to have to go back with him, but is there any chance that he could apply for a way to get back here and stay with his family, or is that it? They're all here. She wasn't born here. She was brought over illegally. But Well, there are special provisions that I didn't have time to get into. Sorry, if there, too are big, I'm sorry. Sure. there are certain provisions for unaccompanied minors in the United States. Now, they have expanded these, these laws, which have been wonderful for children. So if, for example, a child is here by themselves, if they've been abandoned, neglected, or abused, there is a way for them to get special immigrant ju juvenile status, stay in the United States, they don't have to leave, and they can potentially get their legal permanent resident status. And the Sonoma County courts are uh, they're doing very well with these cases now, and they're really able to identify the children. I'm also the attorney for the county. I represent the dependent children, and I help them get their legal permanent residence status if they're, uh, if they're here illegally and they're abused and taken from the parents or neglected. Or, but also, independent of being independent of the court, you could, you could still do that through a guardianship or an adoption. Well, so okay. if the child might have hope, I don't know about the father, if he's not he's going to have Yeah, she's not in an abusive situation. She's still here with her illegal mother. <laughs> so I don't know what her chances she has. Yeah, I mean, it might be worth looking into. Yeah. The, the law is that only they only have to be abandoned by one parent. Oh, interesting. Okay. But immigration doesn't like that law, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are all undocumented immigrants here illegally? Yes. I, I, I use that interchangeably. But it can be, as, as you said, that someone comes in on a valid visa, one of the non-immigrant visas, and they overstay by one day. They're in the same position as everyone who, who came in, you know, without authorization. Yeah. What about somebody, just a little different spin, comes in from Canada, marries a United States citizen, lives on, a, has a green card, and then something happens to a U.S. citizen, so the U.S. citizen dies to the Canadian green card holder person have to go back to Canada? Oh, no. no, they are a legal permanent resident. They are, so yeah. it doesn't matter about their... No, only if they could, immigration try to show some type of fraud in the marriage from the inception or something, but if there's nothing like that, they, they shouldn't be fine. Okay. Yes. I have a question about uh, one year projections on yes. the increase of immigration. Is that proportion to the growth of population? Yes. So as we, as the population increases, we'll see more immigration into the United States? Yeah, that's a great point, actually. In terms of growth in the United States, the demographers are projecting that that's precisely where the growth is going to exist among immigrants, and particularly among Asian and also Latinos. 
So if we're thinking about, for example, our schools, you know, from elementary to junior high to high school, who's going to be actually attending those schools is precisely this group. That's where we're going to actually be seeing the growth. So that's a really, really good question. Really, really good point. But I think they've cut down on Yes. Yes, in terms of substantial. And not only that, a lot of people are actually going back by themselves um, because of this issue of availability of the economic crisis. Um, the actual Mexican government is not knowing how to actually deal with this very important wave of actually people going voluntarily, by voluntary means, going back to Mexico, and not only Mexico, but throughout Central America. Mm -hmm. can, can I just add something to that? Um, even though the growth, uh, the demographic growth in the United States is particularly concentrated among, uh, among groups that are overrepresented uh, in, in immigration, but proportional to the rest of the population, we actually have fewer immigrants in the United States now compared to native-born Americans than we did at the turn of the 20th century. <coughs> so, you know, even though the, it, they're taking over and there's this huge brown invasion that's threatening our way of life, um, or so it would appear, proportionally there are less foreign-born people in the United States now than there were in 1910. Both they're just not white. The same, I mean, they're, just what thing. you're saying is that they're, uh, the U.S. population is also growing as well. As right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, immigrant population is growing faster than the native born population, but proportionally they're still, you know, a minority and, and smaller <laughs> than they have been in the past. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for you. Um, I'm sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that if, and on that quote, a documented uh, visitor, right, comes to the legal visa to the United States, is not allowed to go to school, uh, to public school. Uh, however, once this visa is expired or is an overstay, like, you know, what happens? Are they allowed now to go to public schools or not? Well, that's an interesting question because, as you know, there are schools are full children that are undocumented. Correct. That's right. Why I'm well, they're not allowed to do that either. They're not elect supposedly. For example, if it, it does violate your status to go to school full time, if you're a tourist, <coughs> it violates your status. So what I'm saying is we need to maintain our non-immigrant status so we have opportunities to switch to another type of status or adjust. And you will not be able to do that if you violated the status. Doesn't it like contradict, the, like for instance, the AB 540 law in California? Doesn't it contradict uh, what the immigration uh, work is trying to do? Because for the AB 540, you are allowed to go to school as long as you have, you know, you went to high school or whatever the requirements are. Yeah, it is contradictory. So it's, like it's contradictory. Very, uh, the B2 does not allow <laughs> full time study. And, but yet, everyone else here who is undocumented and in school, I mean, sort of, to, not to say this in the wrong way, but they've kind of given up on maintaining their status. They're yeah. just going to do their thing, and they're not going to exclude those kids from school. So that's why, like, a lot of cases, they have to be look at case-to-case at, um, -case basis because the law is very elastic in a way. Well, it's contradictory on that point. It is contradictory, but it's not contradictory in terms of that you shouldn't study full time at B2 because they will deny you if you try to like share your friends. Yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to say I also have some red cards here. I don't know if anyone's interested, but it does give out some rights that undocumented people have here in the United States. Um, you know, if they were to be picked up, they still have certain rights. For example, the right to remain silent, they do not have to open the door, and it's certain things that are very useful to people, undocumented people here in this country. Um, Immigrant Legal Resource Center in San Francisco, I believe, has produced these cards. And they have advised everyone to hand the card to the police officer, and it tells their rights, although undocumented. And I think they're very useful to people. How hard is it for excuse me, students to get the, the uh, student visas at this point to study here? At, at Ohio Education. It should be okay. It should be okay if you haven't otherwise violated your status before. Again, if you've lived here legally at any point in your life, you're not going to get any of those non-immigrant visas. 
But I mean, did they do that on a quota basis from every country? No, they or? do not. There is no so quota. But if you've never been to the United States before right. and you honestly apply and meet the qualifications of the school, the school will issue an I-20 form showing oh, the that, school. Okay. That, that you do qualify, you are accepted, someone has shown that they will sponsor you financially. And if they accept you, you send that to immigration and or the consulate, and they should approve that F-1. And an F-1 is a great visa because it's usually for duration of status. So as long as you are a full-time student, you can keep the F-1, which could be four or five years. And you just switch it when you go to different schools. 